9.5 is composition of functions. So before I start, I just want to thank everyone for watching my channel. And I love the comments that get left. Uh, they make me laugh and they make me want to carry on and keep teaching you new things in math. And um, hopefully I'll have enough time to do some calculus and vectors for you. So composition of functions, this is the old fog and golf trick. We talked about fog and golf back in grade 11. And um, it came about, I think, in chapter one when we talked about uh, function notation. So what does fog x mean? So fog of x, where you see the O, if you just put a bracket there, you can change it into what we want it to be here, which is just really f at g at x, which makes a lot more sense. Um, I think you will be able to understand this much easier than fog. And same thing with golf x. We'll just put g and where we see that, oh, we're going to put a bracket. And that means g of f at x. So in order for you to do any calculations with these, you have to evaluate g at x first and plug in that solution to find f at the solution value. Now in your textbook, there's all kinds of complicated discussions in the need to know, know section about how to determine domain and range. And, and we know about domain and range in terms of how it has to overlap, just like we did in addition, subtraction, multiplication, division questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the domain of the inside function and make sure that the two of them are overlapping. We'll get into that a little later. I'm going to do a few of the more difficult questions from your textbook. And also, um, there's one really kind of confusing question that I, I will spend a bit of time on to help you out. Okay, so let's look at this question here. It says f of x equals 2x minus 3, gx is 1 minus x squared. And you can tell from both of these equations that they're just polynomial equations. And the domain for both of those would be x is an element of real numbers. So we don't have to worry about um, any domain restrictions in this case. So let's say, um, what is fog? So fog x is f at g at x. And if you want to know what that is, all you're doing again, now you're going to take the 1 minus x squared and you're going to plug it in where you see the x. I highly recommend you put some brackets when you do that, or you might make a very serious math mistake when you're expanding and simplifying. So that gives me 2 minus 2x squared minus 3, and that would be minus 2x squared minus 1. And there you go, you found fog. Are you in a fog? Hopefully not. Okay, now what's g at f at x? So this time I'm going to take what f of x is, which is this, and I'm going to plug it in for this x. Now watch, you want to put brackets around the x because you're going to plug it in and square it. So I have 1 minus my f of x was 2x minus 3, and I'm going to square that. So now I just need to expand and simplify. Remember how to square a binomial. And you see this minus sign? You should have little alarm bells go off when you see negative signs because you want a bracket there to make sure that you're not going to forget that everything in this bracket is going to change signs because it really means minus 1 times everything in here. So squaring the binomial, square twice the product. The product is minus 6 twice it is minus 12x plus 9 and now I'm going to change the sign of everything in the bracket nice and carefully. Don't race. Okay so now I'm going to write in descending order combining anything that goes together. 1 minus 9 is minus 8 and there's your answer to the first the golf. That's fog that's golf. Domain and range both are going to be real numbers. Okay let's move on to this kind of question. Number two in your textbook, they give you a series of points. Oh, I didn't write out the questions that you have to answer. Okay, so let's get that down quickly here. What's fog five? Fog five. That'll be the first one. You can start thinking about that while I find the other one I wanted to do, which was, this is C, and I'm going to do F. I should also remind you while I'm, I'm writing this out that there are numerous and I mean numerous 
mistakes in this textbook solutions. So sometimes you might find that, um, you know, you can't figure out why you're wrong and you probably aren't wrong. So if you go to my PB Wiki site, there is right at the beginning of it, um, a link that takes you to all the correct solutions in your textbook. And again, I'll mention some of them when I take up some of the questions on the next page. Okay, so here we go. We're trying to find f of g at 5. So that's the same as f at g at 5. And what is g at 5? So start here. Do this little itty bitty part here. What's g at 5? g at 5 is 3. So that means I want to know what is f at 3. And now I go here. What's f at 3? And I get 10. And there's your answer. How easy is that? I'll even make a happy face because it's so easy. Now this one, what's the inverse of g of f at 1? Okay, so let's write it out this way first. The inverse at f at 1. Okay, so what's f at 1? We go over here. f at 1 is 2. So it's saying, what is the height of the function when x is 1? And you get 2. And now we want to know, what is the inverse when x is 2? Now we remember how to find the inverse of a set of points. All you have to do is flip them around. Right? So this is really 0, 2, 1, 3, 2, 4. And I could stop right there, but I'm going to do them all. 3, 5, and 4, 6. Really fast. A couple of commas in there. Now I want to know what is the inverse. The inverse when x is 2, and you get 4. And that's your answer. Okay, so that's, that's quite doable, isn't it? For everyone involved. Okay, let's flip over. I have a couple of questions that involve uh, some domain restrictions this time. So I have f at x is 4 minus x squared and g at x is x squared. I want to know what fog is, what goth is, and what are their domain and ranges. So fog x. So that's f at g at x. So I'm going to take the g at x, I'm going to plug it in for the x only. So I'm going to get this, right? I'm going to have 4 minus x squared squared. 4 minus x squared squared. This is one of the ones in your textbook that has the incorrect solution in the back of the book, as well as d. That's why I'm doing two of these. And also e is also wrong, but you can, like I said, you could check those farther in the, off the PB Wiki site. Okay, so if I expand this now, I had 4 minus x to the fourth. So what I want to know is what makes this equal to zero? Right? What makes this equal to zero? So if I want to figure that out, I need to know x to the fourth is equal to four. So that would be x squared is plus or minus two. And that means x is going to be plus or minus the square root of 2. So there's my domain. Um, if I want to know how to get from here now to the solution for the domain, the domain of the combined function or the combination function, I need to know what happens between minus root 2 and 2. So the question is, am I going to be inside here or outside. So the easiest way to do that is to plug in a point like, let's say, 0. So if I put in 0 here, I would have the square root of 4, which is 2. So that's that's OK. Right? That's a doable. So that means that the solution has to be between these two points. So your domain is going to be x is an element of real numbers. x is between minus root 2 and root 2. Now you might say, okay, but the domain restriction on f of x here was just plus and minus 2, right? If I asked you uh, to solve what makes this equal to 0, so you'd have plus 2 and minus 2 it would be out here, but only this part is a part that's going to overlap when we make the, comp the composite function. So I want x is an element of real numbers. This is domain. Oops. Put an equal sign in the wrong spot there. X is an element of real numbers. 
negative root 2 is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to the root of 2. Okay, so now that I've got that, I need to know what will be the range of this function. So if I put in the negative root of 2 into here, and I square, or raise it to the fourth power, so that would be, um, what do we say, it's going to give us 0, right? That's going to be 0, and this one's going to give us 0, because that's how we figured this out. But what happens right in the middle? Because these numbers here are going to be the same. Right? If I put in minus root 1 or plus root 1, or the only place where it's going to be, um, where we're going to get a very different answer, other than being on other side of this, is when I put in the 0. And the square root of 4 is 2, so that means the range is going to go between 0 and 2 if I graph this. So range is going to be y is an element of real numbers, and this is um, regarding be between 0 and 2. So 0 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to 2 is my solution. Okay? And now that's fog. Now let's do the Goff one. Goff is going to be g at f at x. So this time I have this squared, right? So I'm plugging in for this x and putting all that in here. So 4 minus x squared. Now if I square that, that's just going to get rid of the radical sign. So I'm going to have 4 minus x squared. Um, what is the domain here for this function? Well, it's the domain of the radical function. So 4 minus x squared, I'm going to get x is equal to plus or minus 2. And if I plug in 2 here, because remember, we're still under the radical squared. So if I put in 2 squared, I would get 0. If I put in 0, 4 minus 0 is 0. And that's going to give me 4. So that means that my range is going to be y is an element of real numbers. And y goes between 0 and 4. And that's your fog and golf for that one. Okay, does that make sense? I hope so. I hope you're understanding what's going on here because we have to um, we have to watch. Like even though we we uh, simplified this to this function, what happened here when I had um, a restriction on this? Right, the restriction here is plus or minus two. Um, I could put it here, minus 2 and 2. That's my domain restriction for this function. So that domain restriction has to hold for this. Because once you simplify this, you have 4 minus x squared. You're going to say, well, there's no domain restriction on that because that's a parabola, right? A negative parabola shifted up 4 units. It's like this. So where's the restriction on that? Well, the restriction comes from this. So the initial function plays a role in what your restriction is going to be. And that, of course, is going to limit your range when you plug the values in here. Okay, so let's take a look at this one here. So I have f at x is 2 to the x. And I have g at x is the square root of x minus 1. Oh, we didn't finish the domain here, right? So the domain was x is an element of real numbers and minus 2 less than x less than or equal to 2 like that because again it came from up here. Okay I have 2 to the x and the square root of x minus 1 so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do fog so f of g at x is going to be equal to I'm plugging this in now for the x so 2 to the square root of x minus 1 Okay, so what's the restriction on this? So x is an element of real numbers. This is going to be my domain. And x has to be greater than or equal to 1. Because if I put in 0, I would have a negative number. Or you can simply set this equal to 0 and solve, and there you go. 
So the domain x now is real numbers, x is greater than or equal to 1. What's my range going to be? Well, when I put in um, 1 into this equation, if I put 1 here, 1 minus 1 is 0, and 2 to the 0 is 1. So that means the domain has to be y is greater than or equal to 1, and y is an element of real numbers, which I had already stated here. Okay, let's look at the Goff part now. Goff x. So I'm going the other way. So now I'm going to put the 2x in for this one. So where I see the x, I put in 2 to the x minus 1. So um, what's the domain, the restriction on 2 to the x minus 1? So 2 to the x minus 1 is equal to 0. 2 to the x is equal to 1. So that means x is equal to 0. Because when I put in 0 here, I'm going to have the square root of 0, which is 0. Okay, so my restriction g of f of x, I have x is equal to 0, and I need to figure out um, greater than or equal to 0. That's going to be my domain, and the range is going to simply be y is greater than or equal to 0 y is an element of real numbers. And there you go. Okay, so that's, I know it's all kind of a little bit confusing, um, the domains and ranges and who knows what goes where, and I hope that will help you with that section. Okay, now let's take a look at the last question. Oops, that made a lot of noise. Okay, so here I wanted to take a look at this with you because when I first looked at it, I thought, oh, this is so confusing. Why do they make it so hard? So let me see if I can simplify this for you. <coughs> so they gave you the graph here of f of x. Boom, 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 boom. The functions below and the functions below match the correct composition with each graph. Justify your choices. So here's your choices here. Right, which one of these matches which of these graphs? So if I do f of g at x, that means I'm doing f at g at x. f at g at x would be f at x plus 3, right? That's f at x plus 3. Now if I asked you what transformation happened to the function if I change it to x plus 3, and you would say shifted horizontally to the left 3. So now I have to look at the graphs below and see, are there any graphs that match that type of transformation? Is anything shifted to the left 3? So let's pick a point here. So look, we do 3 and 1. So if it went to the left 3, it should be 3 and 0. So is there a graph that has, sorry, I'm not 3 and 0. It's at 3 and 1, and now it's going to be at 0 and 1. So do we have a 0, 1 on this graph? on these six graphs anywhere. <clears throat> well, there's a zero one here, <coughs> excuse me, but that wasn't shifted to the left, right? That went to the right. So that means that, no, this one doesn't belong to any of them. Okay, let's look at f at h at x. So h at x would be f at x minus three this time. And now I think you know where to go. Something shifted to the right 3. So if I took this graph and moved it to the right 3, this is going to be at 1 and 1. And this would be at 3 plus 3 is 6 and 1. So, oh, look here. 1, 1, 6 and 1. Okay, so this is little letter B. And it is a horizontal shift to the right 3 units. Okay, so we've covered that one. That's a good one. Okay, so f at k at x. So k at x is negative x. So I'm looking at f at negative x. Right? f at negative x. f at negative x means a reflection. Remember, the x's are changing from negative to positive. So a reflection about the y-axis. So do we see any reflections about the y-axis? So this is flat. Then it goes up, down. And this is going up here. So if you reflect it, it's going to be coming down first, not flat. 
So this one's flat, this one's flat, this one's flat, this one's flat, flat. Oh, this one here. See how that's going down? So that's being reflected. So let's check one of the points. So on the original function, we had three and one. So that means it should be negative three and one. And this one here satisfies that right here. So this is minus three, one here. So that means this is f at negative x and f at negative x was this one, kx, f at k at x. So this is k. Okay, you're following along, hopefully. Now let's go to this one, f at m at x. m, m at x is 2x. I don't know if you're seeing this. Okay, so f at 2x. What's f at 2x means? f at 2x means that you have a vertical, or sorry, a horizontal compression of a half. Horizontal compression of a half. So if this is 3 and I compress it by a half, it should be now at 1 and a half. So do I have a graph that looks pretty much the, sh the same but has been compressed? And look here, see this one? That's 3 and 1 and a half. Uh, let's take a look at another point. So we had minus 2 here. So minus 2 is going to give us, uh, sorry, divided by half is going to be minus 1 and 1. And that is that point here, minus 1, 1. So that means that this one will be C. So mm, M at X, right? So C is going to be... Our D. Okay, so let's look at E. So what's F at N at X? F at N at X is a reflection about the Y axis and a horizontal stretch by a factor of two. So we don't have any other reflections. We only had this one. This is the only reflection. So if we see a negative X, that one's it's not in the cards for these graphs, right? There's nothing else that's coming down like this first. So mm, that's not one. And F at P at X, P at X is a horizontal shift four units to the right. And we don't have any of those either. Okay, four to the right would mean this point would be at six and one. We don't have, well, what about this one? Is this it, six and one? No, we already used that one. We use that for, oh, sorry, it wouldn't be six and one. It would have been seven and one because this is three. Three plus four would be seven. Okay, so that one's off the, off the radar. So we've got three of them worked. Now we have this set, uh, situation where we have G at F at X. So how are we going to determine that? Because we don't have an equation for this function over here, but we do have the points, right? So let's pick a point. So F, let's say, what is F at um, 3? Because that's a nice one to work with. F at 3 is 1. So if F at 3 is 1, what's G at 1 going to be equal to? So G at 1 should be 4. So G at 1 equals 4. So that means F at G at X, or sorry, G at F at X, G at F at X would be equal to 4. All right, that's 4, G at F at X, and that was when we plugged in 3 here, F at 3. So our coordinates have to be 3 and 4. So we're really finding G at F at 3. Okay, I hope you still follow me. Because G at F at 3, remember F at 3 was 1, and G at 1, G at 1 was 4. So that gives a point 3, 4. Do we have a point 3, 4 on this? Oh, maybe this one. 3, 4. Okay, so this is 3, 4. Is that going to work for another point? So let's take a look at the um, F at G at F at 0. So G at F at 0 would be F at 0 is 7. So I want G at 7, and G at 7 would be 10. So that worked, right? Here's 0, 10. So 0, 10, and that works. 
and that means this is G. Now I've got that one covered. Okay, so you can work on the others. I'm going to tell you what the last one was. Let's see, I've got, um, we didn't do D. We need to find out what this one is. And I'll explain, it, this is really long to go through each one of these. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to jump to the solution here and I'll show you why. So F, let's do P at F at three is going to be, now we know F at three from this graph, F at three is one. So what's P at one equal to? P at one is negative three. So that means three and minus three is a coordinate. So it matches with this one here, this D three and minus three. So this happens to be L. And the other one we're looking for is A and it happens to be this one here, K. So again, I'll do the, I'm going to do the um, N at F at X. So what is N at, um, what we were doing before three? N at, or sorry, F at three. N at F at three is going to be N at and F at 3, remember that was from here. F at 3 was 1. So what's N at 1? And N at 1 is going to be minus 0 0.5. So that means I have the coordinates 3 and minus 0 0.5. So 3 and minus 0 0.5, that's this one right here. Am I showing you that? So A happens to be, what do I just say, K. Okay, so I hope that helped you out. It, it's, like I said, when I first looked at that, oh, what are they trying to ask here? So I, I hope I made that clear for you on how to work forward and backwards. These are two different types of calculations. This one gives you just the transformations, and this, you kind of have to work backwards from your function f and x. Okay, that was a pretty long lesson. I hope it all helped you out. And uh, don't forget to subscribe. Only uh, about 30% of people who watch my channel have subscribed. I hope it's not you. Bye for now.